you know I do travel overseas to teach and in one place where I taught in Singapore I taught there and afterwards I was banned. They said you can't come and teach in our place anymore. I was quite proud of that because the reason was that so many people came into my talk it broke all the fire regulations <laughs> and they couldn't stop the people pouring in. So the people running the show said, oh, no more. <laughs> I remember even one lady, she came early, about an hour early to get a seat. And then coming an hour early was great. She got a nice seat, but then she had to go to the toilet. She went outside to go to the toilet. She couldn't get inside again. <laughs> I felt very guilty, but never mind. That's a true story. That was in Lavender Road, if anybody knows Singapore. But anyway, for the... I do feel sorry, but there's nothing you can do about it. But for the talk tonight, again, I don't um, decide what I'm going to speak about until the last moment. But for me, the last moment was before I came uh, you know, into the reception area, because one of the monks that you know, you know a very good monk who I ordained, Venerable Mudito, Ajahn Mudito now, he may even be listening to this talk, but uh, he sent me a little article this evening uh, about uh, an int a very important message. And it was something I mentioned before, but it wasn't sort of so, so well put, and it wasn't actually in the words of the person who experienced this event. And he said, it's a wonderful story story about anger and forgiveness. And I listened to it twice to try and remember the details which are really important. But again, I'll probably forget a few of the details, but I'm sure if you get online you can find something about the story. And again, it was from the Second World War uh, about the um, concentration camp, the extermination camp, called Auschwitz. And it was uh, one of the people who was in Auschwitz but survived. Her name was Eva, Eva Kaur. Her sister was Miriam. They were only 10 years of age when uh, they were arrested no, for no reason other than they were Jewish and they were taken into Poland and the two girls didn't know what they were doing but they put on cattle trucks without food or water and eventually they arrived at the station called Auschwitz they were on the platforms there and then uh, they noticed that these two girls only 10 years of age were identical twins and so they got taken away from the mother and just to be able to imagine that, what she was describing, that she didn't really realize that that was the last time she'd ever see her mother, ever. And then taken to a place where there was other twins, identical twins. And that's where they were examined, measured, all the clothes taken off. And then uh, she was injected by uh, one of the doctors. I think she even said it was Dr. Mengele. And he said then she was, uh, the doctor looked at her the next day and just said she's going to die in a couple of weeks. But she was so upset, even as a 10 year old said, I'm not gonna die. I'm gonna do anything it takes to make sure that I don't die. And she actually survived. You know, in two or three weeks she was still alive. She managed to get through that. And the fear she had at the time was that if she died, then her sister would also be killed so they could do an autopsy to compa compare the effects on these two kids. But then she survived and it was towards the end of the Second World War when this happened. So they not only survived, but then the camp was sort of taken over by the, the Allies, they called it in those days, and they were freed. And she eventually got back to her home and all her family had been exterminated and so she had a huge amount of, of 
difficulties dealing with that traumatic incident. Eventually, to cut the story short, uh, she migrated to the United States, eventually got married, but always had this terrible anger about what happened to her and her kid sister. Later on, the kid sister was also suffering and was um, dying, but she managed to donate her kidney to her sister, so she could keep going for a bit longer, but eventually her kid sister died. And that was just traumatic, the only other family she had. Her sister had gone. And then the anger she felt was just so great. But then she realized that it was torturing her. So she managed to contact one of the doctors. I'm not sure if this doctor had been through a prison or whatever. One of the doctors who was in Auschwitz, whose job was to, um, after the gas chambers had done their work, to go inside the gas chamber and to count how many bodies died so they could have the death certificates. And didn't actually give them names, just numbers. And she managed to contact him and asked if you know, she could meet him. He was 82 at the time. And so you know, he said yes. And she was terrified that he, she was going to meet you know, one of the, the uh, Nazis at the time who had given her and her sister such a hard time. But nevertheless, the first thing she noticed was how polite and how welcoming and how gentle this doctor was. And they talked and she invited him to come in a couple of weeks time into Auschwitz together so that they could talk again and where it actually happened. And then after going into Auschwitz where all this happened, then she realized something that all this time she had so much anger and fear as well that it was ruining her life. So she decided to do something radical about this. She wrote him a letter saying, I forgive you. And she meant it. And she said, when she said that, posted that letter, I forgive you, she realized that forgiveness is something which no one can let you do, they can't force you to do it, and they can't stop you from doing it. It is your personal choice. And she said, why don't I make that choice? And as soon as she did that choice to forgive, it was just like all of that burden of guilt, not guilt, but anger, sorry, all that burden of anger and problems with her life, uh, feeling that that had ruined her whole life and the life of her sister and her family, all of that grief just vanished almost instantaneously. And she found out that that forgiveness was how to stop that anger which was so deep inside of her. Before, she would always identify as a victim. Now, she was a victor. Not over the people who had harmed her, but over anger itself. She vanquished the anger from her heart. And when she was telling this story, that she wanted to make sure that other people heard it, so she filmed it. Uh, but she died during the filming of it. But nevertheless, I remember looking at that little film this evening, it's only six or seven minutes, in her own voice, and how it's your choice to forgive. Even if it's somebody who had caused you so much pain, destroyed your whole family. And sometimes I wonder when people ask, how can I overcome anger in my life? And I just notice that connection between the anger and the inability to forgive. 
And sometimes you think, why should I forgive? And one of the other stories which I told to this, uh, just looking if they're here today, I think they've already gone back. Uh, this, um, this Indian family who came over to see me. And uh, they were asking how to overcome anger. But before I told them how to overcome anger, I had to tell them a little story about how much I respect India, not only because of the birthplace of the Buddha, but also their attitudes to life and their, um, their culture. And I said that there was once this big conference on telecommunications. And in this telecommunication conference, the Brits got up first of all, and they made an announcement that said, we've just discovered, we haven't let this be known before, but under London, we found all these old, um, what was it, brass wires. And that tells us, they were going all over the place, that tells, that tells us that the Indians, so no, that the English had telecommunications long before anybody else in the world, because brass was you know, really old. And then, and don't know if you know that the competitiveness between the French and the English, the French guy came up and said, we can't stand this. The English are probably lying. So they said, actually we've been excavating under Paris and we've been found copper wires. And copper wires are much older than brass and those copper wires show that France had telecommunications long before Britain did. And then the American gentleman was next and got up and said, we can't let these Europeans outdo the Americans. And said, we've been excavating underneath New York and we've been found these ancient iron cables everywhere. They're a bit rusty, but they're iron cables which show that our indigenous population had telecommunications a long time before you people did in Europe. And they're, they're all making it up. And then the Indian came up to the uh, podium and said, well actually, that we've been doing excavations under New Delhi, under Mumbai, and many other places, and we've not found any wires at all under those cities, which shows that India invented wireless technology <laughs> a, long, <laughs> a, a long time before any of you. <laughs> but that was the end of the argument. But anyway, <laughs> That when they started to say they wanted some help how to deal with anger, it's very easy to say just to forgive, but let's take this a bit more deep. And I told the old story, which I'm sure every one of you have heard before, but I'm going to take it to a deeper level. But the main story, first of all, was from the man who had the afternoon off work. And because he had an afternoon off work, his wife told him, look, I need some eggs for dinner this evening. I haven't got enough in the kitchen. Would you mind going to the market and buying you know, half a dozen eggs for me? And he said, yeah, I'd love to, but I've never been to the market before. You'll have to tell me where to go and which shop it is and what type of eggs to get. And so she gave him a little mud map and some instructions on a piece of paper. He had the time, so happily he went off to the market to buy these eggs for his wife. And then when he got into the market, this young man came up to him. He'd never seen this young man ever before. And the young man went right up to his face, looked at him and said, I've never seen such an ugly man in all my life. You got a face like a camel, the back end of a camel that is, and you smell like you use dog poo as a deodorant. And that's just how he got started. And he started 
uh, criticizing and abusing and cursing this husband so badly. The husband didn't even have a chance to say anything. I don't know you. I never met you before. First time in the market. Why are you doing this to me? But that just encouraged this young man to really start cursing him. And so he turned around and went home. And when he went home, he slammed the door. And his wife said, you're home early, darling. Yes, and don't ever send me to that stupid market ever again. That's so uncivilized. I don't know why anyone wants to go there. It's a really terrible place. But why don't people talk to each other nicely? I've never seen anybody like this before. It's terrible. And when he finished blabbering like that, his wife said, what happened? And when he told his wife that he'd been abused by this young man for no reason at all, his wife said, oh, it's him. He abuses everybody. That poor young man, when he was a boy, he fell over and he hit his head. He's brain damaged. The poor boy can't go to school. He would never sort of enjoy sport. I'm just looking at Sri Lankans. He would never be able to play glamour cricket. <laughs> he would never be able to find a nice girl to show his life with. But he just hangs around the market. And he abuses me sometimes. He abuses somebody else. Just today was your turn. But he's brain damaged. Don't worry about it. And as soon as his husband heard that he'd been abused by someone who was brain damaged, who was crazy, then he calmed down. And as soon as his wife saw that he calmed down, she said to him, darling, I still need those eggs. <laughs> I don't know how many times you've heard that, and you still laugh <laughs> when I say that. <coughs> I still need those eggs. So he said, okay, and don't mind that poor boy. Yeah, I never realized he was brain damaged. So off they went to the market, he brought those eggs. He was abused again by this man. Hold your noses, everybody. Here's the one who uses dog poo for soap. And he brought those eggs, and they talked to the lady selling those eggs. Oh, yeah, such a shame, the poor boy. You know, he's just, that's who he is. He you know, can't do anything better. He's brain damaged. And he walked home without any problem whatsoever. And the moral of that story is, if your, say, husband comes home in the evening, and start shouting at you and abusing you. Or if your wife does that to you, you know, why are you home so late? Why can't you come home early? You know I was having dinner properly for you today. Why are you just coming so late? Don't get angry back at her. Just assume that your husband has hit his head that day <laughs> and is suffering temporary brain damage. <laughs> And that's a nice little way to deal with anger. Because no one in their right mind, no one who was intelligent or who was um, not mad, would ever get angry. Especially at people you love and care for and have to live with. Why would you get angry? It doesn't make any sense. So anyway, it shows a sign of craziness if you get angry. So why is it that when you realize that a person doesn't mean anything, it's just what's happening to them, and there's just some brain damage or something. Why is it you don't get angry then? And the reason is, a lot of times, you don't see the cause, you think this is unfair, you think this is personal criticism, you think there is something wrong, and it makes it much harder to forgive when you think there must be really something there. And also sometimes you get upset. If somebody comes up to you and said, you're stupid. The reason why you get upset is because you think they may be right. <laughs> if you do get upset, they were right. That's how Ajahn Chah used to teach me. And one of the worst things you could call somebody in Asia is a dog. You know, using the worst for, word for dog. And he told me, if anyone calls you a dog, 
Don't get upset or angry. Instead, be scientific. If they call you a dog, look at your bottom and see if you have a tail. If you have a tail, then they were right. Thank you, sir, you were right. If you haven't got a tail, then you can't be a dog. End of problem. <laughs> In other words, it's much easier to forgive when you know the other person's wrong. One of those stories which remember from that time I can't resist telling again was that there was an American, Afro-American uh, GI in Ubon during the Vietnam War. And he was in a rickshaw going from the base outside of Ubon in northeast Thailand into town. And as he was in this rickshaw, the cycle rickshaw, the driver of the rickshaw pedaled past some of his friends by the side of the road and they were drinking alcohol. And so one of his friends shouted out, seeing this Afro-American soldier in the back, and shouted out racist comment, racist criticisms. Where are you taking that dirty dog to? They said in Thai. And when that's you know, unacceptable, if that soldier understood what was being said, that could be a fight, and he was a big guy. But the soldier was just looking around at the countryside. So the driver assumed he didn't understand what was said. So he decided also to have some fun. He said, I'm taking this dirty dog to throw in the river to give him a wash. Ha 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 ha. And then the soldier was just looking at the countryside. They all laughed and he carried on pedaling. When they got into town, the soldier got out of the rickshaw and started walking away without paying. And at that, the rickshaw driver, he knew a little English. No, money, money, fair, fair. And at that, the soldier turned around and said in perfect Thai language, dogs don't have money. <laughs> And some say, yeah, well done, soldier. <laughs> Have you ever seen a dog with money? So if, the do <laughs> if someone calls you a dog, it means you don't have to pay. Dogs don't have money. <laughs> but, any <laughs> but anyhow, a lot of times that we get angry, either because people f you feel that people are personally criticizing you, and sometimes you always feel that's unfair, even though sometimes it is deserved. That's one of the reasons why also, when someone would criticize Ajahn Chah, he did something wrong, he would just laugh. I thought that's a much better response to criticism than getting angry, to laugh. What he was doing is laugh to say this world is never perfect. And there's not a perfect human being anywhere in this room. Is there anybody perfect here? Put your hand up now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> okay, so those of you who come here with your partner, he's admitted he's not perfect. And she's admitted he's not, she's not perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be happy in life, to be peaceful in life. So are your kids perfect? This is one of the things I've told many times here. If any of your kids come in the top 5% at school, or the bottom 5% at school, you are not a good Buddhist parent. Because in Buddhism, we practice the middle way. <laughs> we avoid extreme <laughs> avoid extremes. <laughs> See, that's what I do. I, I laugh too much. I'm sorry. <laughs> so if your kid comes in the middle somewhere, say, "See, Dad, 
my, your teacher, Ajahn Brahm, tells you this is the very best, to be in the middle somewhere. <laughs> the middle way. <laughs> anyway, that judging makes us angry. And what was that other time? I was a school teacher for one year. And uh, the, of course, this must happen. At the end of the school year, you know, we had to um, grade the children. This is the old way of doing things. You know, who came top as a class of about, about 30, and who came bottom of the class? I remember when I gave out the report cards to the kids, and I gave out the report card to this boy. He'd come bottom of the class, 30th in the class. And he knew he wasn't smart, but when I actually gave him, said, you're bottom, 30th. The poor boy, you could see, he started showing the signs of depression. Shoulders slumped, his head went down, he wouldn't look at me in the eyes. And I could read his mind, he was starting thinking about all of the, the comments he'd get from his friends, you're stupid, you're dumb. And even worse, what he would get from his parents when he gave the report card to them in the, in the evening. Bottom of the class. And even then, they all knew I was a Buddhist. And I had to practice compassion, kindness. So I decided to do two things, take him out of his depression and also teach a little bit of Buddhism about Dhamma. So what I did, I said to him, said, you come bottom of the class. I know you're much smarter than that, so I think you've done this on purpose. We have this concept in Buddhism of the Bodhisattva. A Bodhisattva sacrifices their own happiness so no one else would have to suffer. They do it on purpose. And I said, that's probably you. You've deliberately taken the bottom spot in this class, so none of your friends will have to suffer what you're going to suffer this evening <laughs> when your parents find out that you're bottom of the class. And I know you've done that out of compassion, not out of stupidity. You've taken on that role of bottom of the class, and no one else has to suffer that. Congratulations. And I told him at the end of this class, I'm going to go to the principal and I'm going to nominate you for the Bodhisattva of the Year Award in this school by voluntarily taking the bottom place so no one has, has to suffer what you're going to get tonight. And I remember him looking up at me as if I was the craziest teacher he'd ever known in his life. <laughs> Probably true. <laughs> but it took away and he started giggling. It took away his depression. But I did add the most important thing that you're only allowed to take the Bodhisattva Prize once when you're in school. So please do much better next year, okay? <laughs> so, but anyway, it was just trying to take away the being upset, which does lead to anger, why me? Stupid teacher, stupid class, stupid school. Why do I have to do this when I always come bottom or whatever? Instead of actually getting upset and angry at these things we face in life, we make much better use of them. Understand that sometimes this happens in life. Sometimes you come bottom, then you come top next time. And for all of the people who they, they do the year 12 exams and they don't get into the right place where they think they belong, I often tell the Buddhist parents, look, Albert Einstein never finished university. Stephen Jobs just dropped out of university and became a billionaire. So did Michael Dell. So did who else? There's quite a few of them. Became billionaires. So if you make your son or daughter continue at university when they don't want to, you're stopping them becoming a billionaire. Is that really what you want to do? <laughs> In other words, taking away the negative part which people add to what happens in life, taking away the idea of failure, 
And so it's much easier to allow it to be and it's more what we call like the forgiveness. The forgiveness is not just saying to someone, I forgive you. It's even saying it to yourself, I forgive me. I didn't do well this year. Or did I do well? I may have learned a lot, you know, from not coming top of the class or not, you know, getting a Nobel Prize or whatever. That emotional intelligence, which is forgiveness, acceptance, people don't need to be perfect, but you need to be free. Free of all those burdens and restrictions and demands which you put on yourself. One of the stories I remember was of this, uh, one of the fellow monks who told me about one of his friends would always win these, these races, you know, in like one mile or ra race or, I don't know, thousand meters or whatever. But every time that he was won these long distance races, you know, he was so fast that many people thought he'd be an Olympic athlete when he uh, got a bit older. But then he lost the race. He lost it badly. And he went up to ask his friend, how come you lost? And he replied, because I finally understood I did not need to win. And then he lived a very happy, peaceful life. Sometimes we're taught we have to win. We have to be something we're not. We have to, and so a lot of times that creates so much tightness and tension in us that we get angry at ourselves and angry at others. With all the monks at Bodhinyana Monastery, and all the nuns at Dharmasara, and all the monks, you know, Venerable Mudito, hopefully listening at NBM, because I mentioned his name earlier. Each one of you, you don't have to be perfect. And if I think it's my job to make you all perfect, I'll be stressed out, and I'll be in, in Greylands Hospital a long time ago. And so, And your kids, they don't have to be perfect. Please love them as they are. Again, I haven't said this for a while, but it's very important when this first happened. I thank you for bringing your, your kids to the temple because they get to know the monks and they get to trust us and they get to use us as an extra resource in their life. And this one girl came up to me, she was about seven, no, 17, 18, or 17 I think at the time, she was Sri Lankan. And she came up, I need to tell you something, Ajahn Brahm, just quietly, privately, if possible. I can't be totally private. But she said she was had a big problem. And said, what is your problem? And she was pregnant with her boyfriend. And I said, have you told your mum and dad yet? And she said, no, that's why I've come to you. Could you please tell them for me? And I've known her since she was really tiny. And I was actually quite honored that they would ask me something like that. But then I asked her, I said, why don't you tell your mum and dad that? They'd kill me, she said. And that really started making me consider, why are your kids afraid of you? Yeah, you love them, you want them keep them out of trouble. But how many of your children, when they really do get into trouble, they're afraid of telling you? And I thought, that's a big problem there. So don't get upset or angry at your kid. One thing which I would encourage you to do, to let your kids know, son, daughter, you can tell me anything you like as long as you're honest, I will never shout at you, punish you, or scold you. But please be honest with me. 
So if they do have a problem, a difficult problem, like maybe your son gets involved in drugs or something, they can come to you and you won't scold them, but you listen to them, say, look son, it's not a good thing to do, but I'm here to help. That's when your children really need you. But anyway, if they can't do that, at least they can come and ask me, or one of the other monks, <laughs> and we'll talk to your parents about it. And I often notice that that's sometimes, that why can't we be more forgiving to our kids? Yeah, of course they make mistakes. I did this on purpose once. I was visiting my brother. He has two kids. And when they were about 14 or 15, my brother was out doing something on his computer. I know I was a monk at the time. And so I was just talking to my nephew and niece. And as I was talking to them, and they said, what was our dad really like when he was our age? And of course, you know, it's my brother, I grew up with him. So I started telling him all the stories which my brother did when he was their age. And they were fascinated. They said, he never tells this to us, tells another story. And then my brother came in. So what are you saying? <laughs> I'm trying to bring my children up to be good children. I said, well, this is actually how to bring them up as good children to realize you weren't perfect, but you grew up into a really good dad. You don't have to be perfect, but you have to be honest. And that's when you share, I'm saying that, but <laughs> I've got to be honest with you now because there's one of my friends from university, I'm going to meet him again, there's another conference which we're doing over in Singapore at the end of the month, end of the year, sorry, in December, and you know, that I often quote him, Bernard Carr. You know, he was a, an associate, a very close associate of Stephen Hawkins. He was also this guy who was the president of the Psychic Research Society. We go hunting ghosts together, really, and not exaggeration. And he's still a very close friend. So I talked him into going to this conference in Singapore uh, in December. But when he came here for a conference here, I taught him into coming here as well couple of years ago. How long ago was that, that global conference on Buddhism we did over here? But I made sure that I picked him up, you know, I couldn't pick him up at the airport, he arrived in the middle of the night and made sure he had a nice um, hotel to stay in or a motel or whatever. And so I went to pick him up early in the morning before any other member of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia picked him up. And I said, let's have a cup of tea. So we had a cup of tea together, and I said, now listen, I know that many of the people here are going to ask you, what was Ajahn Brahm really like <laughs> when he was a student? <laughs> what did he get up to? And I said, now listen, Bernard, you know, I was at college with you as well. If you tell what I got up to, I will tell your wife, <laughs> who was having a shower at that time, what you did as well. So let's have an agreement. <laughs> so <laughs> that was our agreement. <laughs> but anyway, just a young man, just experimenting with things and just seeing what happens. But you know, we're you know, pretty good by today, by anybody's standards. But nevertheless, it was we made that agreement. And so when I was actually telling my nephew and niece what my father got up to, it was actually good for them because they realized he wasn't perfect, but he was just a very loving, good dad. You don't have to be perfect to be successful. You're being a human being. And that means that they, both of them, grow up to be really good kids. And it also means that the forgiveness is easy. You don't expect your parents to be fully enlightened arahats. That's the line. If they were, they would have been able to conceive you, would they? <laughs> in other words, they all had a little bit few faults, but they're really kind and good and loving. And when we don't expect perfection, it's easy to give forgiveness 
and it's less likely to have any anger at all. And so those two things make our life much more happy and much more free. And the next story, again, I can't resist these real stories I've accumulated in my life. When I was visiting a friend over in Bundaberg in Queensland, and on the way back uh, in uh, Brisbane, before I went to the airport, there's one of the gentlemen there inviting me for dana, for dinner in his house. So I went there for the lunch, when I was talking to him, I was just talking, just being polite. How many kids have you got? Yeah, I've got two sons. I said, are they here? One of them is, but the, one, the other one, I haven't seen him for about seven, eight years. How come? Has he gone overseas? No, he lives a few suburbs away. How come you haven't seen him for such a long time? He said, oh, we had some sort of argument. And I saw the younger son. There he says, have you got your elder son's telephone number? He said, yes. Give him a call now, please. The thing was, because in Sri Lanka, I'm very well respected, and so they, they didn't dare saying no. So he got out his phone and called his, his elder brother. And once he got through, he said, give me the phone. And I picked up the phone and said, this is true, this is exactly what happened. I said, this is Ajahn Brahm here. Ajahn Brahm? He said, yes, I'm at your dad's house. Come immediately. And I put the phone down. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this poor young man didn't have a choice. <laughs> he was scared that something terrible would happen to him if he didn't obey me. So he, <laughs> he, he came to his dad's house. And they hadn't seen each other for seven or eight years. And he sat you know, next to his father. I ordered him to sit down here. They would look at each other. One looked this way, the other one looked that way. <laughs> and I asked his dad, what happened? You know, why haven't you seen each other? This is the first time you've seen each other for seven or eight years. And his father said, actually, you know, I, I can't remember. <laughs> and I asked his son, well, what, what happened? What's your opinion, what happened? I can't remember either. I just couldn't believe that, but that's what they said. They hadn't seen each other, but they couldn't remember why not. <laughs> Human beings are crazy. But anyway, I said, okay, enough. So I turned around and looked at each other. So they looked at each other, and they, I think they shook or he put his hands up to his father, and we had a nice lunch together. It was, it's crazy, why can't people forgive? It's much easier, much more fun. And you don't feel there's something unfinished business somewhere in the back which you, you, know, you have to uh, deal with. So they came back together. And many of you know Bodhinyana Monastery. Those steel tables in the Dharna Sala, where the food goes on, he donated those out of gratitude. Thank you for bringing my family together. So it's wonderful little little gift he gave. And when I see those tables, I always remember where they came from. So it's, you know that monks and nuns were much cheaper than psychologists. <laughs> Give us a cup of tea and they would do anything. <laughs> or a cup of coffee or something. So anyhow, that's why that big act of forgiveness by the lady over in Auschwitz. That was a brilliant sort of story. I have mentioned it before, but the first time I saw it, spoken by the lady herself. But just one last little anecdote, which I read many years ago about Auschwitz, was that there was a backpacker, an American backpacker, you know, this is after the war, maybe in the 1950s, who was working his way around Europe. In those days, you know, you can get a job almost anywhere as a young man. And one of the great places to get jobs was in restaurants, because in restaurants you get free food. You have to work as waiters or washing up, whatever is needed. You get a little bit of money as well, and tips too. If you do a good job, you can make some money there. 
and then you can go on to the next destination. This was actually happening in Vienna. And this American was working in this restaurant, and then one day the owner of the restaurant said, said, oh, there's been a mistake that we've ordered too much sauerkraut. That sauerkraut is a German dish usually. Amanda loves it. Amanda said monastery. And it's like pickled cabbage. And, you know, if they put that on my plate, it would be very hard for me to eat because it's a very strong, pickly taste. But anyway, so we've, we've ordered too much pickled cabbage. So, if any of you staff want to eat for free, it has to be pickled cabbage, sauerkraut. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, I don't care, sauerkraut. Anything else you have to pay for. And this American, you understand Americans, you know, their sense of rights and freedoms. And he said, that's not in our contract while we're working at this restaurant. You don't have to do that anywhere else. It's well known if you're in a restaurant, you know, you work, you get free food, whatever you want. You're not going to do this to us, said this young American. And that was when the chef, the cook, said, come over here. And the chef took this American into a back room and showed him the numbers tattooed on his arm. The chef used to be in Auschwitz. And the chef said, said, no, every morning in Auschwitz, honestly, I never knew whether I was going to uh, go to sleep that night or be gassed and killed like everybody else. He said, living in Auschwitz, that's a problem. Eating sauerkraut is an irritation. <laughs> Please know the difference. <laughs> and when you know the difference between a problem and an irritation, it solves so many difficulties in your life. Having your wife say something really terrible to you, honestly, that's an irritation. It's not a problem. <laughs> Losing your job, that's an irritation. It's not a problem. So remember, so often we get angry at what are irritations. They're not real problems, be honest. And then it means when you lower your expectations of life, you can be so much more peaceful, so much more happy. You don't get angry at anybody, you can forgive people really easily, and just eating sauerkraut morning, afternoon, evening, whatever, it's not a problem at all, it's an irritation. But that being said, I know many of you will come tomorrow morning to feed me. Please don't bring any sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. No. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Any qu questions and comments? Anything from the, the audience here before we carry on with what's coming on the internet? I've probably got lots of questions from Germany. <laughs> what's wrong with sauerkraut? <laughs> How many of you like sauerkraut? <laughs> so I apologise. <laughs> Okay, you've got any questions on the computer? No. From the audience? Oh, here it comes. Okay. Let's see what we've got here. Oh, from Sri Lanka, I'm safe. What is your view on technology and the illusion of connectivity that seems to push onto modern society? You could have seen this talk online this evening. You could have just sat in your home and just logged in and seen everything in the comfort of an armchair. And if you didn't like it, you could actually delete everything or stop it. <laughs> Why did you come here? You had to find parking and just uh, find a seat. It's never as comfortable as at home because when actually you are live, it always feels different. 
Why is it that you can listen to all the music of your fam favorite musicians in the comfort, just go on YouTube or something, and you can listen to them with high fidelity? So why do people go to concerts, live concerts, and spend a lot of money and have to wait for a long time before the person comes in and be squashed? Because there's something extra when you see things live than when you see things on a screen. And so ask your kids, if you want to see, I don't know who the famous, if you want to see, what's it, Taylor Swift, would you prefer to see her live or to see her on a screen? Why do people spend so much money going to these concerts? Because seeing it live is different. Even a cricket match, you see it on TV. It's not the same when you're actually there on the ground and seeing it actually happen. So this is one of the reasons why live participation in big events is much different than the connectivity you have just you know, through machines. You ask anybody that, they'll agree. So that's one of the reasons why this place here will never be big enough, this hall here. Even though you can connect all over the world, being here is something different. The next question, what is the Buddhist view on karmic relationship and how to release the karmic debt? Releasing karmic debt is very easy. It's as easy as Letting it go. I didn't hit you, did I? <laughs> In other words, why do people need to keep things? Even from years and years and years ago in the past. If that father and son could remember what they said and why they didn't see each other for seven or eight years, it was irrelevant. Whatever it was, that was years ago. Why can't we forgive? We don't know why a person did anything, why they said that. There's obviously some cause and effect, but let it go. And then you don't have to burp, <coughs> sorry, burp in your mind. Why did I burp just then? Because <laughs> of my lunch, that's why. <laughs> it's not my fault. Who gave me my lunch today? Who came to monastery to feed me? It's your fault, not mine. I often mention this, why do I tell silly jokes? Because my father did. He conditioned me. I've got his genes in me. He used to tell really, really silly jokes. Like that. I don't know if I told this for a while. Like one of his friends. He came home one day and he said one of his friends had a motorbike accident. And they had to take him emergency surgery. He had to amputate his leg. But unfortunately, they amputated the wrong leg. As soon as they found that out, they went straight back in surgery and amputate the other leg as well. And of course, once he, you know, recovered, he sued the hospital. But he lost his case. He didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't blame me for that joke. That was what my father told me. And I believed him at first. <laughs> it was a very bad joke. But that's not my fault, is it? <laughs> anyway, the release of karmic debt is just don't hold it, don't keep it personal. Do, the, of course, the other way they say of doing that is make lots of good karma and then you water down the bad karma of the, of the past. Just like you have some salt, if you put the salt, if I put a spoonful of salt in this, it'd be, I couldn't drink it. If I put uh, this salt in a swimming pool, you wouldn't even taste it. So that's how you dilute things, which is also good. But the best way is just to let it go. And I'm, for those of you who are Buddhists, that's what happens when you're a stream winner, when you let go of the idea of a self. You don't need to keep things from the past. It's why a stream winner is released from all that bad karma which would send you into the lower realms. You can't get reborn there ever again. 
you've let it go. How come? Because you see this idea of non-self. Next question. Do you actually have I feel exhausted, emotionally, and aimless. I often wish I ceased to exist. It's not that hard. Sorry, it's not easy to cease to exist. Many people, have you ever, did you ever see, I, I, I must admit I did watch this movie because I was told by one of our members there it's the best Buddhist movie they had at the time. And it was actually quite close and that was um, Groundhog Day. Yeah, yeah, Groundhog Day. It was kind of Buddhist except the ending. The ending was this guy just was living every day again and again and again and again and again. It's just like the idea of samsara again, reborn again, here we go again, oh no, not again, another sort of life in samsara. But this was like every day. And he got it as perfect as you could get, but that was just so depressing. And so in the end he tried to kill himself. All different ways of killing himself, like driving his car off a cliff, yeah, and his car exploded in flames and people thought he was dead and he woke up the, the, that early in that morning. He was back again, nothing worked. And that, <laughs> and that is why it's, he was trying everything to cease how to exist. And that was just so Buddhist until at the end they found out he fell in love and that means he got out of that cycle. I thought, oh, that's, <laughs> that's not Buddhism. Yeah, anyway, what is this? But you feel exhausted emotionally and aimless. I often wish I said, I'm not very excited about the future, employment and further studies. I graduated not long ago. What should I do? Go on a retreat in a monastery. I'm, I'm serious about this, not a joke. Because what happens is when you can find a time to relax, find some peace, then you got what we call the wisdom of peace. You find, you know, you do feel what you need to do in life and the aimlessness and the tiredness disappears. If you're emotionally exhausted, you can't see anything. You're just like a, a uh, what am I call like the windscreen of your car is just all dusted over and just all grime on it. You can't see clearly. But you come to sort of a monastery, you get yourself nice and peaceful. You don't aim to do anything, you don't try and do anything or get rid of anything, you just relax. And after a while your energy comes back and you get the clarity of stillness. Not just that, but you know, in the Dharma classes I often mention that when the five hindrances is what it's, what it's called, are overcome, together with those disappearing, weariness, and discontent also disappear. You're energized and you're happy. That's one of the ways, well, I shouldn't really tell you all of this, the little tricks, if somebody comes along and said they had a really deep meditation, I, sometimes I don't ask them to describe what they experienced, I just look and see how much energy they have. And just, you know, how they just, they cannot be uh, made discontent. Sometimes, you know, please excuse me, I say to them, I said, they come up over here and they said, I just had a very nice meditation. I said, no, American women can't get into deep meditation. And I look at you and see what you do. You think, what are you saying, Ajahn Brahm? That's misogynist, that's racist, that's this. If that's what you say, then I said, okay, that wasn't a deep meditation. <laughs> if you just laugh, I say, oh yeah, fair enough. And I say, oh, you probably did get a good meditation, well done. Just try and stir people up. If you have discontent, it wasn't a deep meditation. You can't be made upset. <laughs> so anyway, that's the answer, just take some peace. You're exhausted, emotionless and aimless. Take some time. And especially in nature, there's some reason why Best monasteries are in like forests or deserts or places where there's few people, mountains, but lovely nature. And that actually kind of centers you again. How do you know whether an actual body, speech or mind is leading to cultivation of good or destruction of evil? But see what happens afterwards. And if you understand that if it does lead to something good, it's inspiring and you feel peace afterwards. 
Question from India. I am overthinking a lot and that's impacting my daily life. I cannot focus on my work. Any advice? Yeah, there's the overthinking. You find overthinking never gives you solutions. It gives you more problems. So instead of overthinking, take, get all the information you need. It's programmed in your brain and then relax. So often that happens. There was Oh, he was here a few moments ago, but he's gone back now. There was uh, one of our members many years ago. She had this job of um, deciding, signing off on which kids would be taken away from their mums and their dads because their mums and dads was a danger to them. You know, the drugs and alcohol or whatever. Such a tough thing to do taking a kid, you know, four or five years of age, away from their mums for their safety. So you, know, you can imagine that sometimes that was necessary. But anyway, she was a person who had to do that, so a very stressful job. But she came on one of my retreats. But she was really good, she knew what to do. She stopped thinking about her work and meditated for four or five days first two or three days, relaxing, resting, sleeping a lot. And then she came to one of the interviews and she said, Ajahn Brahm, you know, I've got over my tiredness. I wasn't thinking about work at all. But then, I was just having a nice peaceful meditation and all these solutions, they just popped up by themselves. I never asked them to come, I was never thinking, they just, solutions came by themselves. So I went to my room, I wrote them down, and I said, and I've just been thinking of those, they're great solutions. I don't know how I thought about that. I said, that's what happens. You, know, you, you get all the information you can. She had all the information, then drop it. Be peaceful for a couple of days. And then solutions come by themselves. The wisdom born of silence. That's what I do. There you go. So you don't overthink, it's a waste of time. You solve more solutions by relaxing and resting. Any questions from the floor here? Okay, I've gone over time. It's seven minutes past nine, and people have got to go back to their places. It's a long way back to some of the places where you stay. It's at least five minutes from here to my <laughs> playroom. I'm an old monk. So anyway, you can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha, and if you have any other questions, you can come and ask me afterwards. going to bow now, if you wish. If I wish, if my body wishes. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bhagawa Buddhang Bhagawantang Abhiwademi Suakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami Thank you. No, don't, you don't bow to me, they're all bow to you. <laughs>